Dr. Anna Rilly Morales. And uh, again, uh, we like to meet with people every week from NCAR uh, so that you can learn about the, what they do in their jobs and answer questions from those of you who are joining us. Uh, and one really cool part about working at a place like NCAR is that there are so many different types of jobs, such as being a scientist or an engineer or an electrician or a computer programmer, safety expert, a machinist. All these different jobs and more help support our scientific research. And maybe some of you have sent uh, questions ahead of time, uh, but if you haven't, that's okay. Feel free to write those questions in the chat box as we go along. And we'll get to them during the breaks or at the end. And it's okay to put in the chat, if I uh, could have right now, if you would enter into the chat box where you're coming in from today so we have an idea of where geographically we're seeing people. And we'll wait a little bit. Looks like we have Colorado's represented here, Boulder, Erie, Lafayette. Do we have anyone from out of state? And Chicago. Excellent. That's wonderful. So uh, now I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morales, who's going to tell you about what she does and take your questions. Welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, like Tim said, I am in my home. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Um, my name is Dr. Anareli Morales, and I work at NCAR through the Advanced Studies Program. Uh, and today I wanted to talk to you about some experiences I've had chasing storms in Argentina. So first, before I get into all the fun uh, storm chasing, I want to tell you a little bit about me. So let's get to that. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and I have two younger brothers, Giovanni and George, or Jorge, um, and my mom, Francisca, is from Mexico. I also have a cat. Her name is Fig. She's currently napping somewhere in the house. I don't know where she is. Um, and when I was younger, I really enjoyed math and science. Um, I, I liked those classes a lot. And so when I went to college, I decided to keep learning about um, the earth. And so I studied atmospheric science and geology. Um, let's move that over here. And uh, atmospheric science helped me learn more about clouds and storms and the weather. Um, and geology helped me learn about minerals and rocks on the surface and below the surface of the, the earth. Um, when I graduated school or college, I still didn't know what I wanted to be, and I had so many questions. So I went, I continued going to school. So last year I finished my 19th grade um, and I got my PhD or my doctorate degree from uh, the University of Michigan. I also have a master's degree from the uh, Colorado State University. So I've done all the school and I had a really good time. So now I study rain and snow over mountains here in Colorado. So I work at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. And I study rain and snow over mountains because it's really important to know um, where and how much precipitation will fall because the snow that you see in these mountain peaks stays there in the winter and then in the summer when it's more uh, dry and we need the water it melts and it provides water for us to um, take showers to brush our teeth to drink water to water our plants and our crops it's super important to understand the precipitation that happens in the mountains particularly for western states so Colorado California Washington um, so it's, it's very important and most of my work involves using computer models. So like this picture shows, I'm on my computer running simulations, which are just basically making a virtual atmosphere where I can test certain questions and ideas I have on how precipitation falls over mountains. But sometimes I get super lucky and I get to go outside um, and I get to explore new places and travel the world to study the storms in real life. So this is a picture of me when I went to Argentina. And so you might ask, why go to Argentina to study storms? We have storms here. Well, in Argentina, they have some of the biggest, strongest storms in the entire world. And their storms can produce gargantuan-sized hail. Um, this is a new category that was created just for these 
uh, hailstones that fall there. And they can produce a lot of damage to, to cars, to property, to crops, and to people. If they were to hit someone, that's really bad because it's so big. Um, and so the mystery is that we don't know why these storms are so big. Why are they so big in Argentina? So to, to test our hypothesis as to, or our hypothesis is that it has, maybe has to do something with the mountain mountains in that region. So to test this hypothesis, we need to gather data. So we went down to Argentina, me and 100 plus scientists from other countries like Brazil, um, the US, Argentina, and students from all over the world um, traveled down to Argentina for the Relampago Field Project. So Relampago is an acronym that is spelled out here, but it's also play on words because Relampago in Spanish means lightning. And so there was a ton of lightning there also. So all of us went down um, in 2018 and we brought um, a series of instruments. We brought radars, uh, a plane, weather balloons, uh, surface stations, and we all went to study the storms. And so my job in Argentina was to chase storms and gather data. So I will start looping this. Um, basically, a mission day would be people or the forecasters in the operation center would look at the data, would look at the model forecast to determine where they want to dispatch the, the teams. And then they would give us coordinates. Um, we would then pack up our van with our instruments, get to the location, find a safe space where we're um, not in danger of uh, flooding or cars uh, passing by and make sure that there's an area where there aren't any um, power lines or trees where the balloons can get stuck. And then they place us in a, in a grid so that if a storm forms, we can uh, get information from different angles. And so then once we're set and it's time to launch, we launch our balloon. So here's a, a little video of me launching a balloon during this day. Um, the balloon goes up into the sky and as it keeps going, it collects data on temperature, wind speed, moisture, pressure, and I believe that's it. Um, it then uh, translates all that into a, um, or we translate it into this uh, diagram, which we call SKUT diagram. And then that's used um, by the forecasters to learn more about what's going on right now. And then also we can use that data in the future to dig deeper into other questions we might have. So does anyone have any questions at this moment? Looks like I don't okay. see okay. any questions there in the in our chat yet, but you did mention a skew T diagram. Could you yes. tell us more about what that is? So a skew T diagram, may, basically the word skew T means that the temperature lines so some of these lines that are um, skewed, so they're tilted, um, represent the temperature. So there are various different kinds of diagrams, but the one that we typically use is um, this one where the, the temperature lines are tilted. And it's, it's kind of complicated, and I don't know all of the history of it, but it's basically um, a way for us to, to put as much data on one figure, one graph, and try to understand what's going on in the atmosphere um, in one location, basically. And it'll tell you how strong the storm could be if, um, if it's triggered, uh, the potential for um, or the energy available for the storm to rise, um, if there's sections where there's already cloud or there's sections where it's too dry or, um, or, or just where the layers of the atmosphere are. So I will continue. Um, so during our time there, I had a lot of different uh, memories that we created. So sometimes, um, or I guess in this case, we had a launch that had to be aborted. Um, so we had to get rid of the balloon. Um, and so Stacy here decided to pop it on a cacti that, um, cacti that were just there um, nearby. So that was really cool. And we got a picture just when it had popped. Um, here's a, a picture of Eric um, who was, struggling to hold on to the balloon because um, sometimes there were days where it was super windy because the storms were really strong and they uh, had a really strong outflow. So the winds that are coming out uh, from the bottom of the, of the storm where it's raining 
it's really, really strong. And you can kind of see that in the back. Um, there's a big, it looks like a dust storm um, because the, the winds from generated from the storm were pushing um, dust everywhere. So it could get really windy and it would be really hard to hold on to the balloons and they could get stretched out and um, be really unruly. Um, and this is one of my first missions where we also, we didn't always go in the daytime. Sometimes we went at night to uh, study the storms. Um, and so here is one event where we went and there was a lot of noisy frogs. Um, so let's see if you can hear them. Let's see. So I'm waiting for the time because there's a specific time where we have to launch. And you can hear all that noise. It was way louder in person. And we were there for maybe six hours and they were going the whole time. Um, so that was really cool. Um, I also had to take a ton of notes during my first week because I had to learn everything and then teach a new team in a couple of weeks. So I have my lab book here. Um, it's waterproof and I can just write with it in a pencil. Um, so I have like a lot of diagrams where I had to draw exactly what the setup looked like so I didn't mess it up. Uh, I took a ton of notes. I asked a ton of questions from everyone just to make sure that I had all the information I needed to train the next team. And then finally, um, some other little tidbits of what happened uh, when I was there. I got to see my first dust devil. Um, so they're basically like when you're outside and you see the a whirlwind picking up um, leaves and it looks like a little tornado. Um, it's that, but bigger. And so here uh, you could kind of see some of the dust being kicked up. Um, and so I got to see a lot of those um, on some of the really hot days and lots of cool views driving into mountains, um, just really amazing mountain ranges I've never seen before. Um, seeing new animals, I, I think this is a llama. I've never seen a black llama. They're really, really cool. Um, and then also teaching students in Spanish and meeting new people um, was really, really fun. Um, and I, I always like talking to the students because um, my Spanish accent is different from what they're used to um, in their Argentinian Spanish accent. So they always thought it was interesting. Um, so I kind of captivated their attention by just speaking, regardless of what I was saying. <laughs> but yeah, so if you have any questions of uh, field work or um, how I got into field work or any other questions you have, um, I can take those now. Thank yes. you. Well, thank you so much. And yes, the questions have been coming. And uh, one of your colleagues, I think, must be Stephen Nesbitt, has been helping out with the responses. And there, there were questions about how many balloons per day. And he said probably eight balloons per site and 700 throughout uh, Relampago and maybe 2,300 for the whole campaign. And there was another question about the history of the weather. And, uh, um, there's studies in the storms in the region, but they were the first, you were the first one on the ground is, is how he re replied about satellite studies. So hopefully he got that right. I trust yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. And then, then there was another question about your favorite part of working in Argentina and, and why you like being a scientist. Um, my favorite part was actually being in the field. Um, so I'm a, I guess what we would call a modeler. So I use computer models to, to generate um, an atmosphere, a virtual atmosphere, and then perform tests on it. So that just means that I'm kind of in an office for a lot of the time. Um, and so it can kind of get boring. Um, so I really enjoyed being outside and um, it, every single mission was different. So you had to just be flexible and be ready to, to roll with whatever's happening. So this picture is interesting. Um, this was one of the um, more intense storms that we had uh, encountered. Um, so we actually were way in the back here um, at some point. And then we, we didn't have internet access. Um, so we couldn't look at the radar to see what was happening. And uh, we could only, um, I think we had a satellite phone or something. Um, or some kind of uh, 
device that we could send messages to. So basically at some point um, while we were there, we had to abort, we had to leave immediately. Um, so we, this is the, the safer place that we found. Um, we were told to move from that previous location because something was happening and we had to leave. Um, so it just had to be super fast making decisions and keeping everyone safe. And what's the okay. other question? Uh, so there's two more questions that have already come in and um, we have a question from Kevin. He's, he was wondering, did the study yield any promising data or results? Yes, it's still, they're all, the results are still coming. There's a ton of research being done. There were multiple components to the project. So some people are looking at the hydrology. Um, so um, I, I believe I had some notes on that. Um, so one of the results for the hydrology component is that there's changes in land cover um, of the region or that have been happening over time and those changes in the land cover so switching from pasture to crops are affecting how quickly the the rivers um, rise so that's affecting flooding um, for the storm development itself like why do we um, is it true that the mountains are affecting uh, the thunderstorms in this region um, yes it's uh, it seems to be the orientation and the height of the mountains that are affecting um, how strong or they're they're causing or seem to be causing um, the the strong updraft so the air that goes up that that feeds these um, storms and and then there's still a ton more there's something about clouds and aerosols which I don't know what what they're doing but so many people doing research so just keep an eye out on those results because they're definitely coming. Excellent. And we have yet another question. And this comes from Steph. Uh, is there another specific mountain range with weather that you'd like to study? Mm, yes. Um, I would like to study the Sierras Madre del Sur um, there in southern Mexico. So I'm currently starting to learn more about the region and I'm studying um, the, the precipitation I guess we call it climatology. So how does the precipitation change throughout the year um, in this region? Because I have family there and they're all farmers and they heavily rely on the rain from the sky. So um, any small changes can affect their, their crops or, and their yield. So um, I want to understand the precipitation there better. Um, and it's, it's even more complicated there because there's, there's many mountain ranges. And they're all crisscrossing and there's the ocean and there's so many things but i'm really excited because it's a it's a nice challenge being puzzled excellent and uh, we had another question about that hailstone was that you holding the hailstone in the picture and how big was that compared to like an apple or uh i that was not that um i think victoria um uh, this is victoria's mom so victoria is a teen in argentina or in, in cordoba or villa carlos paz is the city um that was holding it um i want to say 23 centimeters maybe uh steve can maybe double check or, or can or, uh, explain how big it was but it was it was pretty big and it might be a record, um, a world record setting hailstone, or maybe not that one, another one. So there's, <laughs> there's, right. They are all like that. There was an even bigger one. Oh my goodness! And have you have you done uh, any storm chasing in the United States? No, um, no, I don't feel confident in my own uh, forecasting abilities to put myself out there. And I also really, really like my car and I don't um, want it to be damaged by hail. Um, so if, I, I would love to see a tornado someday, I've never seen one, but from really far away, safe location, and hopefully it's a tornado that's just happening in the plains where there's no people or houses. Perfect, well, Stephen did get back, he got back with us. He said that hailstone was the size, let me make sure I get this correct, of a small cantaloupe. There you go. And in our chat, if you're not in the chat, I recommend you jump in there. There's a uh, link to our Vanguard Explorer series video with that hailstone in it. And also a link to a journal article uh, published recently about that. So um, it's quite the event having that hailstone drawn. Mm -hmm. And there, there's another question. Are there any tornadoes in Argentina? 
Yes, there are. Um, I believe that there aren't as many as you would expect given the number of storms. And I think that's another research question um, that, that scientists are looking into. But there are tornadoes. All right. Looks like we potentially have exhausted all of our questions. We'll wait just a second to see if anyone else has any questions out there. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, where would you say the Hale Alley and Tornado Alley are in Argentina? Oh, um, not to put you on the spot. Definitely <laughs> are. Um, I don't know where the Tornado Alley is. I feel like the hail was within this region, which is where we went to study. But don't quote me on that. Um, Steve would know way more than I do. <laughs> It sounds like a lot of your colleagues are interested in your talk today, so they're here. Good, I'm glad they are here. They, they have more knowledge for certain things than, than I do. And so it's great to, to share um, our knowledge together. And we did have a, a question about how far the research site, I looked on your slide, I think you might, it might be clear how far the research site was from the ocean. Is that are, where your cursor is? Is that the center of where you work? Yes, we were in somewhere within here. Um, so I don't know distance wise, but we're in the center of Argentina, um, halfway between both oceans. So we never got to see the ocean. We we're actually pretty far away from the Andes. Um, when we went to Mendoza, that's when I actually kind of got to see them. Um, but we, I didn't see them very often. Okay. And Stephen said that uh, the site was about 500 miles to Buenos Aires from the research site, um, and Buenos Aires being on the coast. There was another question about um, hail. Did you see any hail while you were in Argentina? Yeah, we did. Um, for the event um, where we had to run away, basically, this event, um, we after this picture was taken, we then went to um, another location that was a little bit uh, higher ground. Um, then it started hailing. It was pretty small hail, but then when we drove away, um, the hail was basically blanketed the whole um, highway and in the grass and everything. So as I was driving, I could feel the car like crushing the hailstones. They looked, I don't know, maybe like a ping pong ball size. Um, but they had already started melting um, by the time we got there. But there was a lot. And so it, it's just such a diversity of hail. Some of them would be tiny. Some of them would be a little bit bigger. Sometimes the hail would cover a large area. Um, and then sometimes they would just be enormous. Cantaloupe, more cantaloupe size. So it's <laughs> super interesting there. And it's so, I guess one last thing is, is to us, that's amazing. This cantaloupe size hail, that's crazy. But to them, that's normal. Um, so for us, uh, we're like, this is so cool. This is like, like world record uh, hailstone. But to them, we're like, oh, really? Huh, these happen all the time. Um, so it's, I guess it, it emphasizes the need to connect to other places and, and go explore other regions besides your own backyard um, to see what, what is actually extreme. I guess, and what people's point of view are on, on different weather events. Well, that's funny that you should mention that because someone just asked, like, did the children you spoke with at the schools, did they share any stories of observations with you? Oh, yeah, they were super smart on, um, or very knowledgeable on the, their weather. Um, we went to a, a location that was on the mountains, a very rural location, and they definitely, um, we asked them about hail and they immediately were telling us, yeah, sometimes it falls like this, um, sometimes like this, the clouds look like this. Um, so they, they knew their stuff. Um, they're constantly observing um, their surroundings. So they were really, I uh, think we could have learned some more if we kept asking them. <laughs> yes. And one of our uh, listeners, viewers, is has some some knowledge and she said that she's seen the, the inside of a hailstone look like it has tree ring layers to it. Do you know anything about that? Why it would have layers? Yeah, so uh, some hailstones can have layers like onions. Um, 
and they they basically go from clear to, to opaque or so a little um like white, I guess. And I believe that has to do with um, the freezing mechanism. So um, if the, the hailstone happened to freeze really quickly and um, so fast that air bubbles weren't able to escape, then um, the, that layer looks white um, or milky and opaque. But if the freezing occurred slowly um, enough that the, the air bubbles could escape, then it's a lot more uh, clear. Um, and, and then there's a lot more I could talk about, but that's a whole different kind of a event. But it, you could definitely uh, Google it and, and learn more about it, um, and hail growth and hailstones. Well, Dr. Morales, you are an amazing fount of knowledge. And it's been really fun to explore the job of, could we call you a global change ecologist? Uh, no. no, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, what, would uh, you, what would you give as a broad title for yourself? Uh, I don't know, a uh, mountain meteorologist or... A mountain meteorologist. I like, I like understanding rain and snow on mountains. All right, well, excellent. And uh, for everyone who's listening, if you would like to know more about Relampago, the project in Argentina, um, you can go to the link above my heads or right in the chat. I'm going to post links to those campaigns and the link to um, the, the rest of our Ask NCAR sessions coming up. But uh, please put your hands together virtually for Dr. Morales and thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.